What is up, game changers? Good morning to you. This week's topic is worship. But before that, before the show starts, we're going to go around asking people what worship means to them. Follow me. Let's do it. I just wanted to ask you what, what worship means to you. Worship means to me just an intimate time with the Lord. Come on, somebody. Yeah, it's more than just a song. It's intimate time with God. That's what it means to me. How do you, that's the correct answer. It's the first person we ask. Thank you so much. Hello, ma'am. How are you doing? What's your name? Camila. Amen to that. We just wanted to ask you what um, worship means to you. Giving it all to God. Loving Jesus. What's the body? Hello, sir. How are you doing? What's your name? Samuel Benitez. What? Can you repeat that? Samuel Benitez. You're, you're live for Game Changer. It was about to start, but before that, I wanted to ask you, what does worship mean to you? Worship means to, uh, to me surrendering everything that you have to the altar and to the feet of the Lord. Man, I feel Holy Spirit up in here. Come on, somebody. What? Why? Why does that mean that? Because when I end up worshiping, I end up surrendering everything that I have to the Lord, and it's a very an uplifting feeling. You approved. Amen to that. How you doing, sir? How you doing, sir? I just want to, can I ask you one quick question? Can I ask you one quick question? Nope. We'll get him next time. How you doing, sir? How you doing, sir? I just want to, one quick question? One quick question? Can I ask you one quick question, sir? What's your name? My name's Walter. That's not the question, but I just want to know your name. What does worship mean to you? Syncing up with the Lord and just giving him all my attention. Amen to that. I, I like that answer, actually. What, why do you say that? Bruh. All right, guys. So we went around asking people what worship means to them. The show's about to start. Before that, I want to let you know that the Faith Gear Drop is about to come out next week. I just want to let you know. Keep an eye out for that. Also, David Villa's version plan, Faith Factor, is dropping this week. Be on the lookout for that. It's going to be awesome. And last but not least, like I said, this week's topic is worship. So get ready for Game Changer Podcast. All right, how many are ready to worship this morning, man? What an awesome intro we have going on there, man. Good stuff. We were laughing before. Hand Sam slurping <laughs> his cup. All <laughs> nasty. And I, I, man, Sam, you, you little manners there, man. You gotta... So we're talking about worship. We're talking about worship. Hey, don't forget the uh, version plan. I'm excited about the version plan, the Faith Factor. We spent a lot of time on that with... Uh, over really over two different weeks because it's really combining God math and faith factor together. So this morning we're going to go into worship and we talked yesterday, this is how I fight my battles. I'm assuming that we might've left that as the title because uh, we did not get me on. Your worship is your weapon. Your worship is your weapon. Okay. Okay. That'll work. That'll work. All right. So we left off of the scripture and I want to, you know, yesterday kind of transition into today. John 4, 24 says God is spirit. And those who worship God must be led by the Spirit to worship Him according to the truth. And we started the podcast out yesterday with um, with a little with a little revelation on worship, and that is um, when they built the idols to God when when they were tired of waiting on Moses. And we kind of brought up the fact that you're, have you ever been tired of waiting? And I think that pretty much anyone that's listening to this, whether they listen to it live or or on uh, you know, later on, I mean, you've gone through a period of time where you just are flat tired of waiting. And so a lot of times it's when we, when we realize or recognize that we're truly tired of waiting is when the worship escapes, we stop worshiping, right? We, we, we're okay with worshiping as long as we're okay with waiting. But whenever we stop feeling okay with waiting, the first thing to go is our worship. You ever notice like when you're getting ready for work, some of you like to, you know, there's different times when people work out, different times when people, you know, do things, but some people watching like to listen to worship music while they get ready. Well, when you're in a season of, when you're in a season where your faith is built, you know, a lot of times that's the time when you're listening to the worship. But when you get tired of waiting, the first thing to go sometimes is the worship. Mm. You ever notice that? You don't want to hear it because it just, sometimes I think it reminds us where the enemy uses it to remind us. He twists it on us. Isn't it crazy that he can twist our worship? He, he twists it. I mean, because he listen his his position in heaven before he was basically evicted. <laughs> all right, God gave him a pink slip, fired him, evicted him from heaven. His position was over the worship, 
And so he knows how to twist it and manipulate it. I mean, you go, well, I don't know. How, how can he twist something as powerful as worship? Well, he was the worship director and he twisted himself. I mean, how can you be in heaven and be that close to God and plot against God? I mean, so Satan will twist even worship. So he'll twist it on you. So if you, the reason sometimes worship is the first thing to go is not just because, you know, it's, it's sometimes it's because in this very backward way, it reminds us where we're not. And so we're, we're, we, he, he gets us to look at feeling, right? The Bible says we walk by faith, not by sight. He gets us to look at sight. He gets us to look exactly where we are. He, he puts us in a position of this is where you are and these are your circumstances. And all of a sudden you take your mind off of, you stop worshiping and you start listening to him. And so here's the, and here's the crazy thing that I've learned over the years. And this is where I, I think I really want to get into today. You're closer than you think. And the enemy knows this. If you don't stop, if you don't stop worshiping, if you continue to worship God, you continue to press in, you're going to see your breakthrough. We talked yesterday how worship changes the atmosphere of fear and worship will bring breakthrough. Well, the enemy knows this. So what he does is he tries to get you to quit too soon. And, and you get to the place where if you really knew how close you were the times when you quit before, I think it would, I think it would astound some of us. So we must worship God in the spirit and truth. So when they went to the when Moses went to the mountain and they got tired of waiting, they talked Aaron into creating um, false gods. Or and here's the crazy thing about it: he thought he was doing the right thing because the translation of the word Lord ultimately that he used when we're going to dedicate this statue, this this to the Lord, he was saying we're going to dedicate it to Yahweh. We're going to give this to the Lord. But the reality was, his heart was in the wrong place. Their hearts were in the wrong place. And it's funny, it's, we didn't talk about this yesterday, but it's funny because uh, Mike, scroll, um, is that passage up there on the bottom? The very bottom? Yeah, yeah, I don't know if the passage is up there or not. Um, man, no, but it's um, it's so funny. It's the passage, and uh, I think, I can't remember the version that I looked it up in, but it actually says at the end of it, God said to Moses, he's like, hurry up and get back down there. Those people are, those people have lost their mind. <laughs> <laughs> it said, God told Moses, he's like, hurry up and get back down there. Those people, see if you can find that version. Just, just, just find and when it he went down there, didn't he break the Ten Commandments? Well, no, that was a different time. He didn't, oh. he, he, but you know, it was, it was all in that time. No, he, he, uh, but it was, it was, he, he, God told him that though. It was funny. Cause like, I mean, can you imagine like God saying that? Like, hurry, you know, hurry and go down there. Quick, quick, go down the mountain. There it is. Your people have corrupted themselves. There's another version that said they've, they've like gone crazy or something like that. But um, anyway, I just think that's funny. God's like, hurry up. He's like, <laughs> stop talking. He's like, hurry, run, run, Moses, run, run. Come on, go, 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 go. We don't have time to lose. <laughs> I just think that's funny. Anyway, so go back up to the, uh, let's go back up to today. So the scripture is we must worship in the spirit and truth. And I think that everything really, our foundation of worshiping God, right, is found in truth. And one of the greatest battles that we face as believers, and this is what we're going to talk about today, guys, is discouragement, right? Discouragement. Discouragement comes, you know, and um, this, this particular day today was written by Pastor Aaron Burke. So this is from our pastor here at Radiant, uh, some of our pastors in this room. He wrote this day. So this is these are his notes, so I, I, I'm using these today, but I want to give him credit. So one of the greatest battles that we face as believers is discouragement. Mm -hmm. And so we become discouraged when we face unmet expectations. We talked about this, right? We lose heart. We, we, lose, we lose our worship when we meet unmet expectations where we face them. So the relationship ends, right? The, the promotion wasn't achieved. The school didn't accept us. You know, I mean, the list goes on and on. I and mean, we in this room can, you know, we can go around and we can just, we can just say it over and over. We could just go down the line and we can talk about many things, right, that we've experienced where discouragement, right, came into the room. And so this is interesting because I've taught on this before with encouragement. I've never taught on it with discouragement, but I've taught on it with encouragement and what encouragement is. And so let me just say this encouragement that I've taught, I've taught on in the past is just to instill courage into someone. So when we talk about encouraging somebody, sometimes we just think like it's a pat on the back or it's like, hey, you could do it. But the reality is we've, we've dumbed it down to that. The, re, the, real, the real root of encouragement is to instill courage into someone, whatever it takes, right? I mean, it may take a pat on the back for someone. But if you know somebody, if you spend time with somebody to encourage them 
is going to take a lot more, right? It's going to take a lot more than just a pat on the back. So, so instilling courage. So discouragement means to remove courage. So, for instance, why do we not worship sometimes in the morning, you know, when we are going through a certain part or season of the battle? Because we're going to go through many, many battles. We've gone through many, many battles in life, and we've gone through them in worship. We've started out in worship. We've ended in worship, and we've all gone through those moments where we've removed worship. And if we think about it, a lot of times it's based on discouragement, which is, which is removing courage. So the enemy, the enemy succeeded in, in, in removing courage from our life, meaning that we feel like, you know, I don't have what it takes. Like I don't have, I don't even have the, the, the muster, the strength to try today. Again, I'm afraid of failing, right? I'm afraid the same thing's going to happen again. So the courage is removed. We lack courage and then we get paralyzed by fear and worry. Because when courage is removed, right? Fear comes in, worry comes in, which they kind of complement one another. It's like they play off of each other. They're like brothers that are on both sides of you. Imagine this, like, so you've been hanging out with courage, right? You're encouraged, and all of a sudden, you know, you leave courage at home. Courage is something you leave, by the way, right? So you leave courage at home, you become discouraged, and you leave the house, and on your left side is fear, and on your right side is worry. And they act like they're pals, right? They got their arms around each other, but they're playing off of one another. Like, like fear says something, and worry is like, yeah, 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 what if? You know, fear is like, well, you know, what you, you, you know, you could fail again. Worry is like, yeah, man, you know, what, you ever thought about that? What if, what if this time it doesn't work as well? You know, they play off of one another and they're high fiving each other behind their back, behind your back. Mm. If you can think of it that way, it makes sense, right? They're twins, fear and worry. And so you left courage at home. You're discouraged. <clears throat> you're no longer worshiping. Which, by the way, the enemy, the enemy's after your worship. He's not really after your courage. Courage is, is what he can take because he can't steal your worship. But he can steal your courage and you lay down your worship. You get it? Yeah. Think about that for a second. Because you don't worship by the way you feel. You worship in spite of how you feel. Mm. Right? We don't worship because we feel like it. Sometimes we worship when, and, and we happen to feel like it. But how many times have you ever worshipped God and you just didn't feel like it? Mm. A lot. It's hard. But how many times did you do that and not feel a thing? Yeah. And really, how many times, how many times, you know the case is not so, but how many times have you worshiped like that, not felt anything, and then in that time frame thought it was pointless? Felt like it was just hitting the ceilings and just falling flat. Like you're talking to silence. Like you're talking to silence. You're accomplishing nothing. You know? From the standpoint of being um, somebody who serves um, in different worship teams, like I know probably the most discouraging thing was you go through an entire worship set and you feel like you're giving it your all and you look out and everybody around you is just kind of standing there just looking at you guys. Like nothing's happening, nobody's moving. Like that's discouraging too. Something I've just dealt with. I've had plenty of times before I've been up there and I never wanted to play. And, you know, those are the times that honestly I've had my biggest breakthroughs too. Mm -hmm. The yeah. times that I didn't want to worship was all I needed to do was basically just to give it up for a few minutes to get that peace. Yeah. Well, the, the point, here, here's the thing about that, though. The point in all of this, the enemy's point is, to, is, is and Pastor Aaron points out here, is a detour in our destiny. Yeah. <clears throat> it's, he, here's the thing, man. If he can just, you know, time doesn't stop. I turned 49 last week. And, you know, it's interesting because I just remember turning 48. <laughs> like, and I just remember turning 47. And I was thinking, like, next year I'll be 50. And I was thinking, I remember my 40th birthday party that my family threw me. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? Like, in other words, time doesn't stop. And what happens is the enemy knows. This is the crazy thing about it. It's the enemy knows he lost the battle. Imagine, like I said this a few weeks ago, if you knew you lost something. I'm talking like you knew you lost. Like, I'm not talking about you knew you were losing. You knew it was over. Like you could not absolutely win, period. Would you get up and fight every day? <laughs> the, enemy, the enemy knows he lost. So what is his purpose? His purpose is he knows he can't destroy and kill you. The Bible says he, he, the thief comes to steal, kill, and destroy. You know, there's very few people that he can kill and destroy, especially those that are, that are surrounded by Jesus, right? I mean, he, he can't destroy and kill those, right? He couldn't destroy and kill Job. He came and petitioned God, and then God removed just a piece and said, hey, listen, you can't have his life. You can't destroy him. You can't kill him. But you can certainly begin to steal things from him. 
And he did. And so the enemy, the enemy's job is to detour your destiny. Think about that for a second. If he could just delay your destiny, <clears throat> because every time he delays your destiny, he knows, he, he, he feels like he's chipping away at God's plan. He feels like he's chipping away because time doesn't stop. And he knows that, you know, he, he, he thinks if I can just, you know, if I can just get David supposed to do that at 40 years old, that's when, that, that's when he really felt led to do it. But he's 49 and he hasn't done it yet. You know what I mean? Because I've been delaying his destiny. I've been causing issues and I've been tripping them up. The one thing you got to understand that the enemy, and this is off, this is not on Pastor Aaron's notes, but I want to say this to you. The one thing the enemy has always underestimated is God's ability to redeem. Do you, does that make sense to you? Yeah. God redeems time. Like he, he's, he, here's what, here's what God does. God's like, oh, you think you got that? You're going to detour his destiny. I'm going to make what should have happened at 40 happen at 50. And I'm going to make it happen faster, better, and stronger because I'm the God that redeems time. And yeah. that's the God that we need to worship. It's good. Hey Amen. you guys can weigh in anytime. I mean, just, just butt in whatever <laughs> you want to do. Seriously. Cause if not, I'll keep talking. I, I'm just saying interrupt. If you got something, you feel like the Lord's laying on your heart, any comments, that you want and put on the, in, in the notes, we'll, we'll read them if in, if they if they flow with this with the with the deal today. All right. So the result is detouring our destiny, guys. We live in a place of delay, never moving forward into the purpose and plans that God has for our life. So during these seasons of delay and frustration, when you feel like your life is overtaken by discouragement, right? The courage is gone. The courage to try is gone. We have a choice. We can sit back and embrace it. Or we can take the same action that David took throughout all the Psalms, right? How many choose David's process? I think it's funny because, you know, when we're discouraged, the first thing to go, like you were saying, is, is worship. It's our worship. We no longer want to sit there and give that to the Lord. Mm. Um, that's the first thing to go, but it's also the first thing that can encourage us. If we, when we worship, it's not about us. And so when we're fixing our eyes and taking it, okay, here's my situation. Mm -hmm. It sucks. I don't like it. Whatever. Mm -hmm. And we lift our eyes and we fix them on Jesus. We're worried less about our situation and we're fixing our eyes on him and how good and faithful he is. Like this doesn't determine how good and faithful he is. So when we do that, it's kind of interesting that it's the first thing to go, but it's the first thing to encourage us if we actually understand that principle mm -hmm. of worship. It is. It, it, and that's, that is, but here's the crazy thing about it. The reason we're talking about this week and the reason the enemy fights it so much, he knows its power. That's what he did. That's what he tried to steal. Guys, the whole reason the enemy is the enemy. <laughs> like, I mean, Satan was the angel, was, was, it, was the angel that was in charge of, right? Worship. You know, it, and if you study parts of the scripture, I mean, it gets like really dicey and you got to look at it and, and break it apart. But, you know, um, the way he was dressed, he was the most glorious of all the angels. And the way he was not dressed, the way he was built, the way he was made, if you if you study it out, was was as a reflector. Does that mean light? It was a yeah. I mean, he was an angel of light, but he's he was the ref, it was a reflector. Is what I'm saying. Like his his the beauty of of his skin would reflect because he was he was his sole purpose to was to reflect. God was to re, was to reflect, and and so he 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 channeled this, and so here's the thing: he knows its power, he knows its power, and and he knows what it's designed to do, and what and what it can do, and how it can transform. So he that's it's it's it scares him the most. I really feel like, you know, and um, that's why he tries to steal it. That's why he tries to steal it. That's why it's so important, you know. The whole type and shadow of the temple, when someone comes into not only church, we can use church because it's a natural thing, but you can use coming into his presence here on this podcast, coming into your, his presence anywhere you are. You know, the, the, that's, that's the whole theory of starting with praise and then going into a, a, a period of worship. You know, praise is reminding yourself who God is, you know, because you walk in with, with the dirt or the, 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 the leftover of the week, you know, you come in to his presence with, with stuff, no matter what, no matter who we are. And you begin to like remind yourself in him of who he is. And you begin to, to build yourself up and, and, you know, in, in your faith up in God. And then all of a sudden you begin to, you know, then you begin to get into a place where you can, you can be vulnerable, you know, and, um, 
and worship him. And if you, if you look at, you know, um, something that Pastor Aaron put here in the notes, it's interesting, David, so if we're going to pattern after David when it comes to, to how we handle it, he recognized that worship was, you know, one of the greatest weapons that we have. He excelled in it. But listen, some of the things, that, let me remind you some of the things that David said. He wrote, praise the Lord, O my soul. And then he went on to say in that scripture, and all that is within me. The good, the bad, the ugly, every I'm gonna, I'm gonna praise God, right? But then he, but then this is this is some of the things, and this is interesting. Pastor Aaron points these four things out, and we'll go over them. I'll let you guys kind of go over them here. But so when we don't feel it, and we can't, and we can't get ourselves into you know the mindset of worshiping God for where we're going, because we're in the middle of something that's a challenge. Listen to what David says: Forget not all his benefits. So when we're reminded of what God has done, right, we remove the frustration of what we don't see happening. That's powerful. You could tag Pastor Aaron in that on Facebook because Pastor Aaron said, when, we remi- when we're reminded of what God has done, we remove the frustration of what we don't see happening. Isn't that powerful? It's really good. So we don't see it happening. We're frustrated. Okay, we all get it, right? We all know why. Now we know why. But here's what the enemy wants to keep you from. He wants to keep you from remembering all the good things that God has done. And after you do that, you can tag this too. Worship is a weapon that enables us to focus on how good God is instead of how discouraging life can be. Mm -hmm. That's what it is. So let's talk about some of the benefits, guys, that we can do. So if you're in a season of frustration, you're not seeing the answer. You don't see yourself drawing near to the, to the destiny, right? You're in waiting mode. You're frustrated. Things have fallen apart in certain areas. You don't see answers. You don't see breakthrough, right? So David reminds us of some of the benefits. So let's remind each other and our listeners of some of the benefits. Um, he goes on to name uh, who, forgiveness, who forgives all your sins. Um, and he talks on forgiveness and how... Um, we have a God that's worthy to be praised because he forgives us. Mm. Um, we have another one that says he heals all our diseases. He heals all your disease. Like maybe you're sick. Maybe you're like in need of healing. And we serve a God that's a healer. Amen. And we can we can actually see that manifested in our lives because of who he is. Um, then it says he redeems your life from the pit. So he's a redeeming God. Look back right now. Like, Look back to the situation where you were in before you met the Lord, before the Lord came and picked you up from whatever you're in. I know for me, Mm -hmm. I would not be anywhere that I am today without that happening. And just we have a God that we can be thankful for because he didn't give up on us when everyone else did. Mm -hmm. Um, We have another one that says crowns you with love and compassion. Mm -hmm. He gives us a purpose. And that's awesome. We we look for that in so many different ways. And I think that's the reason so many people get so confused and they're going through life looking for a purpose when we have a God that's given it to us. And that's that's an exciting promise that we have. Think about that for a second. So when you're when you're walking through it, guys, <clears throat> you can always worship him for forgiveness. Mm-hmm. So the enemy can't take that away from you. You can always look back to who you were before you met Jesus. And you could always say, I worship God because he redeemed my soul from hell. Hmm. Maybe, maybe you've gone through, as Ashton read, maybe God's touched your body or touched your mind or your emotions. Maybe he's brought you through a healing of a broken relationship or an abusive childhood. So he's healed all your diseases. And you can worship him for that. The enemy can never take that away from you, regardless mm-hmm. of what you're going through now. He redeemed your life from the pit. So redeem how is that different than forgiveness? He forgave you, but then he redeemed you. Meaning you go, you know, the prodigal son knew he'd get forgiveness. He said, I'm going to go back to my dad's house and just be a servant, right? Mm-hmm. It's better to be a servant. He's going to forgive me. He'll let me live there. I'll have, I'll have shelter. I'll have a roof so it doesn't rain on me. I'll eat, you know, the servant's food. I won't be cold because I'll be inside. But when his father, when he came home, his father not only said, welcome back in, but he redeemed him. He gave him back his birthright. He put a ring on his finger. He put a robe on. You know what I mean? He put shoes on his feet. He killed the fat calf, right? I mean, he left the skinny one for everybody else. He killed the fat calf. But here's the thing. Can I just tell you one picture of that grace, of redeeming grace for Jesus that you could worship him? Is God took that prodigal son, and he didn't make him. The father didn't make him go and bathe before he put that robe on him. He put that robe on that dirty boy right there in the middle of that yard. 
Hmm. He redeems you from the pit and then crowns you with love. He gives you a purpose. He reminds you of a purpose. Or he, he places purpose in your life. And you can't ever have that taken away from you because God did those things. Mm -hmm. Amen? There's yeah. times in my life where worship was the only reason I still felt that I had a purpose mm -hmm. um, because I felt everywhere else that I was serving, everything else I was doing was just useless. And the only reason that I stuck with even listening to God was because of worship. That was the only thing that kept me going at certain times. As yeah. There were tough times that I've been through. And I mean, there's times that the enemy has actually taken one of my giftings and one of my passions in life and turned it against me and made it so that I couldn't remember how to worship mm. without being without a very specific set of circumstances. And it's, it's a very weird thing, but yeah, there's times in my life where purpose has been nothing. And like, I'd have been just wandering aimlessly in the desert if I didn't have worship still there. Mm. That's good. It's powerful. Now you know why he goes after it. Yeah. Now you know why he goes after it. He goes after it for these reasons. It's a, it's a, it's a deep, it's a personal thing. We're, you know, when you heard it, if you didn't listen to the intro, Matthias, what a great job. We have a new couple minute intro and, and each week and this week, this topics on worship. So we asked a few people and we got some funny things, but you know, there were a couple of answers where, you know, people gave their answer of what worship means. And, you know, one of the, one of the answers was, it's just a, you know, it's just an intimate time with God, right? It's my time with God. So why does the enemy go after it so hard? Because it's you and God, it's, it's everyone in this room. Your worship is for you and your Jesus, right? It's not, it's not, I mean, yeah, we, we have a corporate worship setting in church and we can turn around, we can look at people, you know, we can watch people raise their hands and, you know, all of that. But the reality, is the majority of the worship that you do in life that's really meaningful takes place when no one else is watching. Mm -hmm. And that's why the enemy's after it. So if you're facing discouragement today, okay, and many people are, fight the battle with the weapon of worship. Praise God for what he has done. And here's the thing. Watch how your discouragement is turned into courage. Mm -hmm. Your fear will turn into faith. This is Pastor Aaron closing it out here on this. Your anxiety will be turned into peace. Mm. Isn't, that, isn't, that, isn't that powerful? Your discouragement turns into courage. Your fear turns into faith. Your anxiety turns into peace. And when we worship, our focus moves from what is not happening to what God has already done. It's good. And by the way, when we focus on what he's already done, I believe, because I said earlier that you're closer than you think. A lot of times when you focus on what he's already done and he gets your focus back there, you're, you're getting ready to land. Because you'll recognize and he'll bring you to a place where as long as you have him, you have all you need. And he, he wants you to have that destiny. So the reality is a lot of times that's, that's the lesson right there. And we get it, and all of a sudden God's like, boom, and he delivers you into your destiny, or the breakthrough comes, and all of a sudden you're like, whoa, I was that close all the time. He just, he just, he just changed our perspective through worship. Amen? Amen. Mm. So good. Look at that, Psalms 9, 1 and 2 there. Let's read that. That's the... I will praise you, Lord, with all my heart and tell you about the wonders you have worked. God most high, I will rejoice. I will celebrate and sing because of you. It's powerful, guys. It's powerful. With all my heart, like thinking on that, like with all my heart, with everything that I am, when you think about what your heart is longing for, what your heart is desiring, I'm going to take that and I'm going to put it in all its effort in rejoicing in what he has done. And... You know, I think someone said in the comments, um, it says sometimes we complain about what he hasn't done and forget what he already has done. And that is so true. Like when we think about that, when we think about someone that we owed a debt to and they forgave us, it's like this big, huge debt and they forgave us, they redeemed us. How do we look at them later down the road like, oh, I deserve that. Mm -hmm. And it's not like we come in saying, yeah, I deserve that to, for God to die for me. It's not that, but it's we live a life that says that. And we do we have actions that complain. We instead of taking those frustrations and laying them at his feet, because I think that's sometimes the beauty in worship. It's not just, 
okay, you know, I'm going to push through. I'm just going to worship God and just, I know this is going to restore me. But sometimes it's, I'm going to lay this at his feet because I have a God that cares about me. Mm. And I can lay it at his feet because he does care and because we are able to worship him through that. And so that's super awesome. Um, That's just an awesome promise that we get to have and get to hold on to. Amen. So we we made a decision yesterday um, to end it, to end it with, you know, to kind of maybe just end it like in a minute of just just letting God touch you, just just having a moment where we can we can play. So there's some music playing in the background, but you know what? I just wanna I just wanna take a moment and, and give you the exclamation point here. Allow you right in the in this because the, the the way the Word of God works, the Bible says these signs shall follow them to the believe, and it just talks about signs. You know, when you preach the Word of God, and that's what we've done this morning, when you teach the Word of God, signs follow. Things happen. Faith rises. And we don't want to, I don't want you to, 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 to be able to leave where you are and have the enemy try to steal this seed from you. Let's seal this this morning. All right, let's seal it when you're listening to this. And so today, let's make it a day of worship. Let's make it a day where we're going to worship God. We're going to lift up the name of Jesus. We're going to honor Him. We're going we're gonna to re- remind ourselves how good he is and how good he's been. Mm-hmm. We're going to look at it and, you know, I know we're chasing the dream. I know we're, we're chasing the dollar. I know we're chasing the next deal. I know we're chasing growth and all of that stuff. And I get it. But the reality is this. Stop for a second and recognize how good God has been. Let's change our focus from what is not happening to what God has already done. Amen. If he never did another thing, if he never, ever did anything else, he's done so much. That's good. So, Father, we worship you today. God, the worship, God, the true worship. Lord, we take, we take God apart every idol, Lord, everything, God, that separates us from you, even if it's just a little bit. God, the things that have come between us. God, the thoughts that have come between us. God, the things that we've placed in front of you. Even if we didn't know we were doing it, Lord consciously but now god bring those things to our 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 mind whatever god is keeping us and stopping us god from experiencing the fullness of what you have for our lives god we just remove those things god everything that separates us from you god we repent we just turn from those ways and god we worship you lord because you are jehovah jireh you are jehovah nisi you are jehovah shalom god you are god you are jehovah Rapha, lord someone needs healing someone needs peace someone needs victory this morning those are that's what those names mean someone needs a provider jehovah jireh this morning someone needs god el shaddai to show up this morning god the god who's more than enough and we just honor you and worship you god because you've been the god that's not just enough but has been more than enough and father god we worship you this morning we honor you this morning and we lift you up this morning we thank you god in advance god for the powerful powerful truth god that you're going to just pour out in our lives, God, throughout this week. I believe, God, that this is going to be a week of breakthrough. A week, Father God, where we just plug ourselves back into the source. Plug ourselves back into the source. I know I'm going to take a, I'm going to go in overtime for two minutes, but I just want to point out something in the beginning. When God created, someone needs to hear this. You need to plug back into the source. <laughs> because when God created in the, in six days, he created everything. So when he created the the waters, when he created fish, he said, waters, bring forth fish of the sea. Bring forth all the, the creatures that swim in the sea. So he, he, the source, water, he looked at the source and he said, bring forth fish. Then he looked at the land and he created it and he said, now bring forth cattle and every creature that crawls on the earth. He looked at the source and he said, bring forth that. Then he created you and I in our image. He looked at the source. He looked at himself, God, the son, Jesus, and God, the Holy Spirit. And he said, Hey, let us make man in our image. He looked at the source and he said, let's, let's make man in our image. So let me just say it this way. You take a fish out of water, the, the, the substance from the source and you lay it on the, on the, on the, on the ground and it flops around for a few minutes and eventually it dies because the, the source has been removed. It mo- removed itself from the source. You take a cow and you tie it in a parking lot on a post with no grass and you remove it from the land and you leave it there for a few days, it may last for a few days, but eventually without water and without food, it dies because you took the, so- the substance from the source. The same thing, when you unplug yourself from the source, when we remove ourselves from source, the source of life, God, 
When you remove yourself, the substance from the source, you can only make it so far. Can we plug back in this morning? Amen? Mm -hmm. Let's plug back in this morning. Father, I just thank you for that. In Jesus' name. Amen. Tune in tomorrow. We're going to talk about worship.